gospel. Amen. Yeah, we talked about um, the perp. We talked about missions being a means to an end. That the purpose of missions is the glory and the worship of God. And we, we, we looked at a number of texts to bring that out. Um, let's go through these texts as a little bit of a review, because um, I want to, this to still be in play in your minds um, as we think about it. So we'll go through them really quickly. Let's uh, turn with me to Reve the book of Revelation, chapter 22. We'll read verses 1 through 5 here. And it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of, the, of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So we looked at this text last week. Um, this is, this is a, a little nugget here in, the, in a larger section speaking of the New Jerusalem. And we noted that there were parallels with Eden from the beginning of creation. So, so God starts with Eden, he ends with Eden. Right? Well, does anyone remember some of the parallels that we saw in this text? Uh, um, for Eden, with Eden, in the beginning of creation. Rebecca. You have the tree of life and you have the, the yeah. rivers um, with healing properties in both. Amen. Yeah, thank you, sister. Yeah, you have the, the river of water of life, right? Um, um, John 7 even refers, it could be a double, double meaning there, uh, referring also to God's spirit too. But you have the river um, as a parallel with Eden. You have the tree of life, right? She mentioned the healing properties of both. In this case, we have the healing of the nations. Uh, there's no more curse in this new Jerusalem, this new Eden. The curse is gone. There's pure worship of the lamb. We have the clear, radiant presence and glory of God here. The throne of God is here. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 7. Verses 9 through 12. So we saw the new Eden there. And we also looked at Revelation chapter 7. And in Revelation chapter 7, we saw a new people. And it reads, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. What a beautiful text. So we, we, saw, we saw the great multitude, the great multitude and the perfect worship um, of God and of the Lamb. And here we see in this, this great multitude, we mentioned how this is the offspring of Abraham. Um, remember God promising Abraham uh, uh, to, 
to telling him to look at the stars and says, as, as the stars are, so your offspring will be. And now we see that promise fulfilled here. We see the unity of all types of people, tall tongues, tribes, and nations. White robes made clean in the lamb's blood. By the lamb's sacrifice, they, have been, they, are, they are made righteous. They worship the lamb with palm branches. Um, makes you think of the, the Feast of Booths or the Triumphal Entry where the people sang um, Hosanna to the, the King of Israel. And um, the people declare salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. All, everyone, people from different tribes, nations, and languages speaking the same language, saying the same thing in unison, John can hear it. He knows what they're saying. And then the angels respond with an amen, blessing and glory and wisdom. And then they all fall to their faces before God. Just a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture. So we, we understand that there's a new Eden and there's a, there's a new people, an innumerable multitude, perfect worship of God. Right? God is bringing all things to a glorious end. And we also looked at Psalm 67. If you turn with me to Psalm 67. And in Psalm 67, we brought out the fact that God's people, they, they delight for this to happen. They delight for the nations to be, they want the nations to be glad. This is the aim of God's people. It reads, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. It's almost as if they're saying, May the Lord bless us and reveal himself to us that he may in turn, through that, bless the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God, in verse 3. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let the, all the ends of the earth fear him. In the center of this text here in verse 4 is, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. And we talked about how that is the heart of God's people. The heart of God's people is to look forward to the nations coming together, all of the nations being blessed the offspring of Abraham being gathered together and them being glad in the Lord. And we talked about how this, this is our motivation for missions. This is what we're after in missions. Um, missions is not, we, we say many times that, you know, this is the reason why we're here, right? To, to, to go, to make disciples, um, to preach the gospel to all nations. And that's true. That's not like a false statement. Um, but it's not, it's not complete either. The reason isn't the work itself. The reason is the fruit of the work. The reason is, is what God will do with the work. Missions is a means to an end. So I pray that that was, a, that was a blessing to you. I know studying that was a, was a blessing to me, um, thinking about that. And we, we, talk, we also talked about duty and delight, right? We talked about how um, taking this into consideration, you know, taking especially Psalm 67 in consideration, missions is, um, it, this understanding makes missions more than just a command, something that you must do. There's a, there's a glorious goal to it. There's a glorious joy at the end of it. You know that in the end, you will rejoice with the innumerable multitude um, at the work that God has done through this means of missions.
And, um, and God himself is glorified in us delighting to do this work. Uh, we brought up the example of uh, Pastor Michael and Noel. I don't know if you remember. We said that if uh, Pastor Michael went to Noel's house, and Noel invited him over, and, and if Noel said, yeah, Pastor Michael, thank you so much for coming over. I'm so glad. And if Pastor Michael said, ah, uh, you know, forget about it. It's, it's my job. I'm your pastor. I should, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to come anyway. That's one thing. It's not wrong for Pastor Michael to necessarily say that. Maybe not with the same tone. <laughs> but um, it's one thing for Pastor Michael to say that. It's another thing if he said, man, I've been looking forward to coming, coming here to your house. I've been looking forward to spending time with you, Noel. Right? And it says something. It says more when there's a delight in the work. And we glorify God when we delight in his work. And all of God's people, they delight. These commandments are not burdensome to us. So, so we've talked about the ends, but today our focus, now we're, we're working from the outside in. So we talked about the ends, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about the means. What's the means to that glorious end? And um, there's a number of ways that you can look at the means to this end. You can look at the work itself. We could talk about what, what is missions? What do you do in missions? What is the message preached in missions? We could talk about our dependence and, and prayer in missions and how um, although we work in missions, God is the one who does the work. But what I would like to focus on today is suffering in missions. We'll focus on suffering. And it is a, is a theme throughout the entire Bible, suffering in missions. Uh, especially in the New Testament, you see it all over the place. And it sort of encapsulates, encapsulates everything else. So, uh, if you want to think with me, let's, let's think of some of the ways people might suffer, maybe not even just in missions, but when we talk about suffering, what kind of things do we think about? Can you guys give me some ideas? What do we think about when we talk about suffering? Nick. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind <clears throat> is the uh, early persecution um, in Rome, like under mm -hmm. Nero, for example, where he would uh, crucify Christians, mm -hmm. send them to the Colosseums. We think of those kind of antiquated ways that you know, people were tortured for Christ's sake, in that sense. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, Christians being being persecuted. Um, now, what what would those Christians be persecuted for? W why why would a Christian be persecuted necessarily? Any ideas, Sixto? Uh, for their faith, for speaking what Nick said in Rome, you had a pantheon of gods, mm -hmm. and Christians thought there was only one God, and Him alone. Yes, yes, for, the, for their faith, particularly in, in opening their mouths, right? Um, sometimes for their good works, but in most cases primarily for opening their mouths, proclaiming um, the gospel, proclaiming the glories of God and of Jesus Christ. What other ways do we see of suffering in the Bible? That's not the only suffering that we see in the Bible, do we? Any other ways we see suffering in the Bible? Josh. Did I have another hand? Okay. In uh, 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. uh, chapter 6, verse 4, mm -hmm. uh, Paul is referring to his own ministry. Yeah. And he says, But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleeplessness and fastings, going without food, um, by purity. Um, I'll, I'll just finish. Um, um, uh, by purity, um, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. Uh, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hands and on the left. Uh, 
by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as, you know, by uh, being accused as deceivers, um, yet true, and he goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorrowful. Um, so there's uh, physical suffering, I guess you could say uh, mental suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these different forms of suffering. Yeah, yeah, very many different forms of suffering. Those are like some of the details of how someone might suffer, uh, especially Paul here, suffering for the sake of the gospel. What, what I'm really after is what are some what are some reasons? What are the other reasons that people suffer apart from the preaching of the gospel? I can give another Yeah. Uh, the other reason is um, disobedience yes. to government law. Yeah. So, for example, in the first century, they had to, um, I forget exactly, but they had to um, proclaim that Caesar is Lord. Mm hmm. In, in accordance with the law of the land. And so, but they couldn't do that because they worship Christ. And so they were persecuted for, for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so th that's another detail, right, of how people might suffer for their faith for the sake of the gospel. But there's other types of suffering apart from suffering for the sake of the gospel or for the sake of obedience to God, right? You have people suffer for the sake of their own, because of their own sin. Right? In your own foolishness, you suffer because of the consequences of your sin. It's like the fool in Proverbs. Um, he's, he becomes poor because of his foolishness. Oh, go ahead, uh, Pastor Michael. No, you're good, bro. You're good. I think um, another reason why Christians have suffered throughout mm -hmm. church history is because of their identification with the people of God. Yes. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, um, verse 34, We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated for, or, or because, because you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So they, <clears throat> they because of their identification with the people of God, namely them visiting those in prison, prison and, yeah. and having compassion on those who were in prison, they were marked. Yes. They were marked as um, those of a like precious faith. And basically it, that put a target on their back for the ungodly and unbelieving world to persecute and plunder. Amen. Amen. I, yeah. I think of a practical way, yeah. you know, like as a, as a, as a business owner, I, I think, I think of it often and it really is a joy. Mm -hmm. um, I had to learn to consider it a joy, but you know, in my identification with the people of God, yeah. you know, and, and this precious and special day, the Lord's day, right? My business is closed. So I'll get phone calls throughout the day, mm -hmm. people wanting garage door service. And, you know, by tomorrow, they've already chosen to go with a, another yeah. a company because I wasn't able to meet their needs and be there right when they needed me to be there. And it's, and it's really like a, a loss, yeah. Right, that, that is a loss, right? That is, um, that is something that I give up, uh, almost a, a type of suffering, a type yeah. of loss, because I choose to I, um, be here with the people of God and keep the Lord's day holy as he's commanded me to. And in my identification with the people of God, I, I suffer loss. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, bro. That's a very good example. So like, let's, let's divide these up into categories. So on one side here, I'm going to lump all of what um, uh, Josh Dodge and Pastor Michael mentioned into one bucket here, um, along with persecution. So this suffering for o either opening your mouth up for God, identifying with the people of God um, for your good works, right? Basically suffering for the faith, suffering for the faith, however that, whatever form that may take. And then we're going to have another bucket over here. Uh, 
and not everything in this bucket is going to be particularly related to each other, but I want to make a separation for how we're going to talk today about suffering. So over here, we'll put suffering because of your own sin in this bucket. Um, there's also other suffering in the Bible, like um, extraordinary providential suffering. Um, for, for, because of God's own reasons, he has decided that this particular person would suffer in this particular way, not because of anything good or bad that they have done. It is not as a result of any righteous action that they have, have done. Um, uh, think, of, uh, think particularly of Job. Then you have um, suffering just because we live in a fallen world. Right? In this fallen world, there is calamity. We have the effects of sin in this world. Um, we have a hurricane rolling in today, right? We live in a fallen world. People have suffered from this hurricane already. Some people likely will suffer in various ways um, because of this hurricane. But we're going to put that in this bucket over here. Um, so, and then um, I also want to put in this bucket suffering that we tend to... Suffering that's not real suffering. So sometimes we don't think very deeply about suffering. Um, have you ever heard like celebrities talk about all the haters out there? You know, <laughs> right? Um, suffering that's petty, petty suffering. We'll put that in this same bucket, okay? And I'm, and I'm making a separation on purpose because I want to talk about this suffering over here. Because this is the suffering that we're talking about associated with missions. The suffering that Pastor Michael mentioned, the suffering that Josh Dodge mentioned. And that's not to belittle all other types of suffering. Well, we definitely want to belittle the petty suffering. <laughs> but, but that's not to belittle all other types of suffering. So it's not to say that someone who is suffering um, with some disease that has nothing to do with some sin that they've committed um, or some, some calamity that has happened, um, maybe a death in the family of some sort. That's not to belittle that suffering. That's not to say that that suffering doesn't matter or that there is no hope or promises in the scripture for people who go through suffering of that type. But when thinking of missions, again, we're thinking of a specific type of suffering. So... Um, uh, so we're talking about suffering for opening your mouth for the Lord Jesus Christ or for doing good works associated with, um, with being one of his. Something that clearly identifies you with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that can be speaking to a family member um, about the gospel and them hating you and them reproaching you. Um, in some places, people experience physical suffering um, for the sake of their evangelism. Uh, for, uh, for some, they may not experience suffering for opening their mouths, but it's just a mere identification. They don't even get, some people don't even get the chance to open their mouths. They just have to walk to a, to a church building, um, and, um, and they experience suffering. So... Um, that is the suffering we're talking about. Uh, it's the type of suffering that Jesus, when uh, calling, um, calling Saul to be converted in Acts chapter 9, he tells Ananias uh, that he is going to show Paul how he's going to suffer for the sake of his name. Jesus says, for the sake of my name, um, in Acts chapter 9, verse 16. So the question is, let, let's think about our suffering for the sake of his name. And the suffering, when we think of the suffering, we can't quite think about our suffering until we think about who's suffering. The suffering of Christ, right? So let's think of Christ's suffering together. And let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. And really we'll start in chapter 52. Verse 13. And starts out by saying, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. 
as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblage and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So, so we see here that there's a contrast. There's a contrast. You see that um, his semblage is marred and many are astonished at him. Um, but at the same time, he will be high and lifted up and exalted. Um, you, you have uh, kings and nations they will, they will shut their mouths at the hearing of the gospel in verse 15. But few will believe, few will believe in this suffering servant. And we see that in chapter 53, verse 1. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Those who believe, those are the ones to whom the arm or the, the, the power of God has been revealed. Um, in order to understand um, truly the suffering of this servant, to, under, to, to identify this suffering servant properly, um, it has to be revealed to you by his spirit. We'll go read, start reading again at verse 2 here. He says, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Um. Consider, consider how the Lord Jesus Christ was despised and rejected here on earth. Um, it, it says that um, we, like we didn't esteem him, um, as if we had nothing t um, to esteem him by in, in front of our eyes. But why is, it, like, why is it that we didn't esteem him? Anyone? Sergio. Because of our own our sin. Yeah, yeah, amen. Uh, Rebecca? I was going to say because of the life he lived during his ministry, one of humility, um, he had no possessions, he had, you know, humble work, um, things that, you know, outwardly man would look at and despise, thinking that, um, you know, in this life he's not prosperous, so therefore he's of no worth, but they didn't see the value in, um, like, his spiritual ministry. Amen. Yeah. Men in our sin, we don't see um, a bunch of shiny things about someone and, and, the, and we despise them and, and foolishness. So Jesus comes and in reality, there is everything interesting and esteemable about the Lord Jesus Christ. People should have been amazed at his righteous works. They should have been amazed at his righteous works long before he did any miracles. They should have been amazed by the fact that he had never sinned. They should have seen the obedience to his parents and said, wow, who is this kid? Um, they should have come and asked questions. They should have wondered, why is he so interested in the teaching of the word of God? But um, they didn't esteem those things. Um, uh, in fact, they despise those things. They rather esteem someone um, who makes a show of themselves. Um, and, and isn't that true of us too in our sin? Like we, did, we weren't living at that time, but we still demonstrated the same despising and rejecting of the Lord Jesus Christ, did we not? Yeah. And our disregard for his word, our disregard for his gospel, um, our, our love of sin. Um, so it says more about us than it does about him. 
It's not so much that he was homely or uncomely. It really it says something about our hearts. Our hearts are black and ugly and cold that we would not see him and see the greatest treasure. Ryan. Uh, I think this kind of goes along with that. I was just thinking, you know, here it says, uh, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking of how um, he spent so much time serving. That was what he came to do. Yeah. <laughs> and the Pharisees looked at him and said, you know, he's a man that eats with sinners. They scoffed at that. His own family said he's going crazy because he's spending so much time, you know, in uh, Mark 3, uh, serving these, these sick and, and needy. Yeah. Uh, they thought it strange when he was talking to the woman at the well. And, you know, like, who is this talking to the, the half-breed, so to speak, or yeah. the woman, um, the Samaritan woman? Uh, so just know that in our sin, we don't um, esteem service to others, mm -hmm. particularly the needy, whether it be spiritually needy or physically needy, as... Uh, something to be uh, exalted. I know that the world does the physical uh, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, but not to, to the way he was serving and certainly not the spiritual. So yeah. uh, I see that too, you know, where he's um, rejected, not necessarily just because of his bodily appearance, but because of his service to the kingdom and to, to the Father. Amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, the, the Son of Man did not come uh, to be served, but to serve. And, uh, and, he, and he, he willingly acquainted himself um, with grief, with sorrow, and he took the shame of the world, um, not just in his appearance, but in his actions. So um, let's read on just a little bit more. It says in verse four, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So consider that, right? Consider the work of Christ for you in the substitutionary atonement. And in the previous section, right, in the first two verse, and in the first few verses of this chapter, it shows how we did not esteem him. But now we see in verse four how we did esteem him. The way we did esteem him was like, man, this guy, something must be wrong with him. God must not like this guy. And we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. And indeed, he was stricken and smitten by God and afflicted, but not for his sin, but for our sin. It was our sin that, that put him on the tree. And it was, it was our iniquity. Um, that was applied to him. And what a, what a gracious Savior, right? What a gracious Savior. Especially, you can see here in this text, you can see our attitude toward him, too, in that. There's nothing we bring to the table, not a bit. And he willingly suffered and speaking of willingly suffer, we see that in the next few verses. In verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that, is bef that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although, although he had done no violence, 
and there was no deceit in his mouth. You see how um, Jesus, he wasn't forced to suffer. Jesus willingly suffered. Jesus gave himself up to suffer. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. Why is a lamb, why is a lamb led to the slaughter silent? Anyone, any ideas? Pastor Michael, he has a donkey. He wouldn't know. Not, not that you would kill your donkey. And, and that donkey is definitely not silent. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm going to go out on the limb. Yeah. But a, a, a lamb led to the slaughter doesn't know it's going yep. to the slaughter. That's right? it. It's, it's naive. I'm yeah. Sorry. Exactly. It's the, the lamb is naive. Right. So a lamb going to the slaughter goes obediently and willingly. Um, you say, come here, little lamb. And the lamb follows. Jesus, different from a real lamb, knew. He, he agonized in his, before his sacrifice, agonized in his knowing in the garden. An agony that we've never felt. At least no one I know has felt. We will never feel but so, so you see Jesus, he willingly um, went to the slaughter. Um, in first Peter, it says he was reviled and he did not revile in return. Um, and uh, I believe um, Peter was thinking here of Isaiah 53 here in this text. Um, he was silent. Um, our, our Lord Jesus, he willingly gave himself up. Um, let's look at verses 10 through 12. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. What victory now. We move now away from suffering and we move to see the reward for his suffering. We see that he gets an offspring, that offspring that we talked about, the offspring of Abraham, that great innumerable multitude. It says, by the knowledge, by his knowledge, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That knowledge is the knowledge of faith by which we're justified. Um, he's born their iniquity and, and he, he shares his spoil. He shares his spoil with the strong, those who overcome his people. So you have the same people who are just a few verses before did not esteem him. And when they did esteem him, they esteemed him stricken by God. He, he takes upon their iniquities upon himself and now these wicked people, in the end, are his offspring. They're his reward. And they receive spoils of, of, of his victory in war here. His dick victory in war over sin. And he makes intercession for the transgressors. He, his role as, as high priest and what a, what a beautiful picture. So you see here the suffering servant. You see his great suffering. But you see how at the end of his suffering, he has purchased a great reward. So that brings us into a segue, right? So Christ, Christ was called to suffer. Um, uh, he came uh, uh, not, to ser not to be served, but to serve. Um, and Mark 8 says... Um, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He told that to his disciples. So he even taught his disciples when he was here in Mark 8, 31, that he, he was appointed, he was called to come and suffer. And he did that. He accomplished his work. And he's seated in heaven right now at the right hand of God. Um, but, but we too, we too, through union with him, have died in him. You've died in him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And, and usually when we think, we think about dying in him, a lot of times we use those texts when we, we think about sanctification, right? We go to Colossians 3, and it says, You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory, right? And then we, then we talk about how we're to put off various sins, Right. We've died with Christ. We have died with the, the flesh is crucified along with his passions and desires. And we put away all of the sin that rises up from the flesh. But um, we also we also we have we have a new relationship with sin in our union with Christ. But we also have a new relationship with the world in our union with Christ. So just as Christ his relationship with the world was one where he received suffering. Our new relationship with the world is one where we receive suffering from the world. We have a new relationship with the world. And we too are called to suffer. And that's why Christ in John 20, um, he says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Right? So Christ is saying, I came... You see how I live, you see how I suffered, you see how I spoke, you do the same. You do the same. So um, considering that, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look briefly at how we too are to suffer. And as you think about your suffering, we still have to understand that Christ's suffering is of a different type, it's of a different category than our suffering. Um, we don't, Christ in his suffering um, bore our sins on himself. We do not bear any sins in our suffering. How, so we do not suffer as Christ suffered um, in the exact same way, but we do suffer um, loving just like Christ loved in his suffering. Um, and, uh, and we suffer having the same relationship with the world as Christ had with the world in our suffering. So look at 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 12. He says, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Why might someone be surprised um, when, when they suffer in the Christian life? And can anyone answer that? Why might, why might someone be surprised? Claudia. Well, because they will say, why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Why is this happening to me? And that, that word happening that you use is a good word to use. Um, why am I suffering here by chance? <laughs> like what's going on? You know, have I run, have I won the, you know, the, the, the other lottery, <laughs> the suffering lottery, right? But um, this is not a strange thing. The Christian is called to suffer. Um, this is by God's providence that you are suffering. Josh, is that a hand? Another reason might be um, lost people are fickle. <laughs> like, he, at one moment, you can have a, a nice conversation. You're like, oh, that was, 
that went really well. Yeah. And then um, the next moment, um, they're threatening you, like a week later. Or, mm -hmm. You know, so you might get surprised by that. You're like, whoa, what happened here? Yeah, and that's a good, I didn't think of that one, but that's a good point. You know, we, we, pr we probably don't understand um, the depths of sin. You know, I think some of us, or if not many of us, have had times where we, you know, you, you might evangelize to someone and you think, man, I'm going to talk to this person. It's, it's, it's all over. This is going to be a wrap. Give me five minutes, you know. <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know, they hate you. Uh, Nick. Um, I would say, and I'll not to explain this a little bit, but Christianity is quite possibly one of the most offensive religions to the world mm -hmm. uh, because unlike, you know, Islam or unlike uh, Hinduism or other or religions where you kind of do good things that kind of weigh your bad things, um, Christianity says no. Like none of that, none of that counts for God um, because it comes from dirty hands, you know, from sinful hands. And so when you're talking to somebody who, so a lost person, or maybe it could be a Christian that just doesn't know the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, like myself, you know, a year ago when, when Pastor Mike preached the gospel to me, um, I, uh, you know, had an idea of who God was as far as like I knew some about his love. And then when he talked to people about love, lost people, they love it. You know, God loves you. God cares about you. And when you unpack what God's love actually is, um, it's quite offensive because it's like, no, God can't love you because of your sin. He can love you in general ways, but he can't, he can't love you like one of his own because of your sin. And when you mm -hmm. go unpacking that with lost people, it's literally the most offensive thing you can say, you know, to mm -hmm. them and their, and their sin and then their pride. Yeah. Um, they, they go against that, just like with Stephen. Um, you know, when he was going through telling an eloquent story about uh, the Old Testament, how God, you know, was with the people. And then he says, you stiff-necked people. When he said that, like, that, that, that switch just flipped in their head. And then they went from a nice conversation, like Josh was saying, to just total offense. They are on the attack against you. And so we yeah. see that pattern when we share the gospel. Yeah, yeah. And we think those times to be strange, but they're not. Uh, Anya. Uh, Anya. <laughs> you can finish your sentence. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I think one of the strangest things that we encounter at the beginning of our walk with the Lord is that um, we know that what the Lord teaches us is holy and true and beautiful, and the angry person becomes mm -hmm. less angry or not angry at all. Yeah. A fornicator stops doing that, and we think that uh, those who are around us will love these things because we are becoming holier and holier uh, as we follow the Lord, but because... Um, we stop doing things that we used to do. It kind of yeah. looks very strange to them, which is what Peter is talking about at the beginning of this um, same chapter. So that, that was strange to me. Yeah. Why would you hate me being kind, for example? Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah, like, and you know, and, and to your point, right, we can easily forget uh, or not realize, especially at first, that um, it is the Spirit of God who has changed our hearts and, and made us um, see this new way now. Um, we, and, um, and the other people that we talk to, unless the Spirit of God is working, um, they're, they're not going to see what you see. Um, there's still, still blindness there. Uh, Ron, whoa, whoa. Say when you, before you were converted, you were enemies of God. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you, you got reconciled with God and then you became enemies of the world. Yeah. And what you have to realize is you just changed teams. All of a sudden you're mm -hmm. in the, uh, you're in the uh, enemy side from the world point of view. Yeah, yeah. And Brian White. Oh, uh, Nancy, we got a lot of hands now. I, I think um, it, also being as a, a, a Christian, you can be surprised with trials because you forget that the Lord tells you you will be persecuted and you will be facing trials. So you mm -hmm. forget that. Yep. And you think that you're above trials. Like you can become prideful and be shocked when you're actually humbled or lowered and, and, you know, face certain adversities and trials. Yeah, yeah, amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. And is that Nancy? Yeah, sorry. I, I just think about when I came to know the Lord and what great joy it was uh -huh. for me and how just elated and it was just such the wonderful, great news, good news, you know? And then you share it with someone and you are just so happy and you're like, come <laughs> on, you just, come on, don't you see, you know? And so to get 
them to, you know, kind of push back against you. Mm -hmm. That's surprising, you know, and I know that was surprising to me in the beginning. It was like, wait, hold on a second. Like, this is great. This is wonderful. Don't you want this? So, yeah, just that. That was surprising. Yeah. And then, and then it, it took a while to finally see it in the scriptures. Like, oh, this is supposed to be happening. You know, okay, yeah, well, yeah. let me embrace this. Let me rejoice in this. You know, versus like, come, like, come on. Let's just really trying to convince. But then just saying, okay, well, I'm, let me rejoice because I am supposed to be getting persecuted. And this is, supp- I'm, this is being fulfilled, you know. So I think that's a, a big difference for me, too. Yeah, amen. Thank you, sister. And speaking of rejoicing, which you just mentioned, right? Um, that's what he's telling us to do here in, in verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted, says in verse 14, for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. What is like what is what does it remind you of when you hear Peter here say, talk about rejoicing and suffering and that you are blessed? Any scriptures come to mind? Noel or I, I picked you over my wife. You got to get it right. <laughs> I was going to say uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Yes, yes. Matthew 5. Very good. So, yeah, the Beatitudes. I think it's fitting, too, that this is Peter who says this, because Peter heard that sermon. <laughs> Peter was there. So Peter is giving his own little Beatitude here. In fact, he uses this, um, there's a number of words used for blessed in, in, in the scripture. And the word he uses here is the same one used in Matthew 5. Um, it's like he's giving a little Beatitude in his, his epistle here. Um, but he says here in verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Think about that, right? um, Almost like what we did before where we distinguish different types of suffering and we mentioned that one type of suffering is suffering for the sake of your own sin, right? Uh, So uh, you want to make for sure that your, your witness, your testimony to the gospel is not marred or that you are not marring it with your sin. You know, the person who's suffering as a murderer um, uh, and w- for the quote-unquote sake of the gospel, that reminds, that's like the person who has an outburst of anger when evangelizing, right? Um, or the one who suffers as a thief. That's like the one who's stealing time on the job to evangelize when they ought to be working. Um, or as, um, as an evildoer, anything evil. <laughs> Right. Or a meddler, you know, the busybody, the person who can't stay out of other people's business, you know, and then you turn around and you want to speak for Christ. And now um, people, people, they can't they can't put two and two together because your testimony has marred is is marred by your sin. Um, He says this in verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in that name. And that word Christian, the word Christian doesn't come up in the Bible very many times. And we don't use it as a derogatory word now, but in the Bible, the word Christian was a derogatory word. That was was an insult to call someone a Christian. Um, The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. That wasn't like a good thing. (laughs) They weren't calling themselves Christians. They were being called Christians. So if you're suffering the shame of the name Christian, um, and we're not talking specifically about the word, the letters on paper, right? But we're talking about the derogatory understanding that the world has towards those who are Christ's. Um, You don't have to be ashamed. In fact, he's telling you not to be ashamed. Um, instead glorify God in that name. You take that derogatory name, whatever it is, whatever today's name would be, and you wear that with a badge of honor. It could be the word Christian, Jesus freak, whatever. I don't know what people use. Science denier? I don't know, right? But you you use whatever word they give you, 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 you wear that with a badge of honor. And you understand that you are blessed. And he says this, for it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, 
what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? He's talking here, this judgment here that he's speaking of toward the household of God is not all judgment in the Bible is a punitive judgment. Um, and this judgment here is, um, this is a purifying and a chastening of God's people. You're not only identifying with Christ in suffering, but you also, God also uses the suffering that you experience as a Christian to purify you and chasten you. Uh, Peter even talks about it in uh, chapter 1, and I, lost, I may have lost my place here. Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, just a few pages to the left, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're doubly blessed. You're doubly blessed. It, it identifies you with him. It marks you as one of his. And on top of that, he's using that suffering for your benefit. And what a, what a glorious thing, right? Uh, you have the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you, as it says in verse 14. So, so think of this suffering. Think of this suffering. Uh, and he says here in verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Creator being very important here. Again, this suffering is ordained by God. He has created you. He has created this world. How would he not know? How would he not know um, what, what is happening? This is all his. So entrust yourself to him. So considering that, um, last week what we did, we looked at the, the passages on the ends, right? We looked at the glory at the end, uh, particularly at the far end, the, the right end, where we see the innumerable multitude glorifying God. We see the new Jerusalem, the new Eden, if you will. And we, um, and then we went back to Matthew 28. We went back to Acts 1:8, and we we thought again about what that means for us as we go, what that means for us as we evangelize um, those near to us and those far away. So I want to encourage you to think of the same thing when it comes to suffering. When it comes to suffering. Think of your identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of your union with him. Think of how you have died in him and you have been, you have been raised in him. And you will be raised actually in him. Actually as in your body. Think of, think of how the benefits of suffering, how um, he will um, bless you in it, how it marks you as his. It should, it should take suffering and make it not such a morbid subject. We, Christian suffering isn't morbid because there's a great end to it. And so I want to encourage you, brethren, to, to suffer and to suffer faithfully and to suffer with joy. And um, when, I, when I think of suffering in this way and I think of the Great Commission, um, I want you to think uh, of ambition. Think of ambition. Um, the, the, when you consider the end, when you consider the glorious end to all this whole story, when you consider the goodness of God to you in suffering and how you're able to identify with him, the joy of it, the glory of it, um, it should produce in you an ambition. It's not, um, so you're, this is the difference between being the hourly worker, the hourly, the, the hourly uh, government, not, not to say hourly work is wrong <laughs> or bad or denigrated, but it's the difference between um, um, doing an, having a, an hourly job of a, a rather mundane task, right? You kind of go to work at the same time and you do the same thing. You clock in, you clock out, you go home. Nothing wrong with that. However, our evangelism ought not to be like that. 
When we think about missions, it ought not to be like that. Um, God has given you a project. He's, he's given you a goal. He has given you something to sit down and be creative about. Creative with how you're going to use your time, how you're going to use your effort, how are you going to use the gifts that he has given you. And we have talked for the last few months, this being our last lesson on glory, we have talked for the last few months on glory, of the glory of God. I want to submit to you that one of the greatest ways you can apply all that you have learned in these last several months is to have ambitions in missions, understanding that the end to that is the glory of God and seeing, seeing with your eyes the glory that we've been talking about for all of these months. And not just seeing with your own eyes, but the fruit of all those who you would speak to or you would have some influence in have helping others to speak to. Um, so consider his glory and consider your work within that realm, and that is your, your mission. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you we thank you for your goodness to us, your kindness, and giving us a mission. Lord, we know that one day we will be with you in glory. We look forward to the new Jerusalem. We look forward to being amongst the innumerable multitude. And Lord, we ask you that you help us to play our part in that. Help us, Lord, to be faithful and to be creative and to, to think very deeply of how we can give up whatever it is we have, whether it is our time, our efforts, not to some morbid end, but to a glorious end. And we praise you for this opportunity, Lord. Please help us and make us faithful in this work. Um, and we pray this in our, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who we look forward to. Um, sitting with on his throne in the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.